afternoon, everybody. I'm just hearing that we recording is in progress now, so be aware of that. Um, you may be recorded if we ask you to say something and also for all the speakers. Uh, welcome to another webinar, another online seminar of the European Heat Pump Association. Today we are talking about a topic that has been quite um, important for us. Uh, the question of whether or not all these heat pumps that we are foreseeing can uh, can be done, can be handled by the electric grid. So we have astutely called it, the lights will stay on with 50 million heat pumps. I will explain in a minute why 50 million heat pumps. Let me welcome uh, with me my three uh, really seasoned experts, Samuel Perez from, um, from Iberdrola. He's the senior prospective research hydrogen and heat leader. Uh, so we see already that there is an integration between different vectors, energy carriers and solutions. Then we have Chantal Degon. Um, she will join us in a minute. She's deputy director for innovative solutions and low carbon uses uh, in, in ODF. She's head of this department, head deputy director of this department. And um, she has told me beforehand that she part of her work is really coordinating the work of people from many different uh, areas and departments. And I think that's something that where we can say this is really uh, one of the most important topics in this in this um, work or in the topic that we're discussing today, coordinate different energy carriers, coordinate different energy streams, and of course, coordinate the people that are experts and responsible for the execution. And then we have <clears throat> Daniela Agostini, Head of Energy and Climate Policies, uh, Policies European Affairs in the NL Group. So he's responsible for the world level. We could also ask him uh, if, if other continents see this topic differently. And he's, he's also very active in a number of associations, among them uh, Euroelectric, where he's also uh, leading the group that is also responsible and, and uh, talking and, and covering this topic. I'm and then we have with us um, Pierre Loeck from the European Commission, responsible for renewable energy hydrogen and the local energy transition. And again, you see a lot of people that will have to work uh, in a coordinated fashion to make this a success. I will give you a brief introduction on uh, why we are doing this seminar. And then we open the floor for reactions from the industry experts, as well as the commission. And uh, obviously also for you, a few housekeeping rules, please put questions in the questions and answer box, and then we will address them as much as we can in writing. Uh, those that are specific and maybe conceptual, we will ask in, uh, in the Q&A. So you see the background slide. Uh, the lights will stay on with 50 million heat pumps. Let me say two words about the European Heat Pump Association. We are a sector organization, meaning we, are not only in, we, have, we don't only have industry members, but we also have uh, members from the component manufacturers area, from national associations, from consultants, from research and uh, test institutes, and also utilities. So, for example, uh, Ivar Rola is one of our members. And we are covering all, he all uh, heat pumps in all application areas. You see here the whole white good area, but also electric cars. These are not necessarily covered by us because in these products, the heat pumps are really a commodity by now. Our focus in the association is on promoting heat pump deployment in residential uh, buildings and commercial buildings, but also in industrial applications, in district heating, and as active nodes in the electric grid. So really this idea of connecting the vectors, uh, electricity and heat, and of course also cooling is part of our mission and vision. Why are we doing this seminar? Let me share with you the development curve of heat pump recognition. Then I thought, no, it was not so much recognition. It was actually a lot of rejection. For many years, we have discussed what heat pumps can do, renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, CO2 emission savings, and people have come back to us saying, yeah, but you know, maybe they don't even work. So that was the first one. Does this heat pump even work? That was maybe 2005, 2006, 2007. Then people concluded that if it works, but then it has to be very efficient, so only geothermal heat pumps make any sense. Technology development has overcome that situation. Then we had a conceptual discussion on whether heat pumps are using renewable energy or if they are energy efficient. And then, of course, since the, the organization uh, structures in the different bodies were organized along these two different terms, then they would put heat pumps here or there. Then we had a big discussion on whether or not they can use in more than residential that was overcome. We can say today that uh, heat pump technology is suitable for uh, more than, than residential buildings, also commercial and industrial applications. And then district heating, they said, but this is so big. How can a heat pump provide energy for a district heating system? And 
again, by, by technology development and by actually true implementation, we can now say that big heat pumps have no problem in, in greening and decarbonizing district heating. And now comes the last, let's say three, the, the top right of my chart here. Do they really work also for innovation? And again, here, technology development has done a lot. And we expect a bit also from the renovation wave strategy that we, um, that we hope to see next week in terms of recognition. And then the question, if we have these many million heat pumps, will they not break the electric grids? And of course, uh, right after that, or maybe in parallel, they are still too expensive. So how, what can you say about these things? And let me talk today about the topic of electric grids. The heat pump market has shown tremendous growth from 2015 to 2020. The annual sales have doubled from 800,000, slightly above 800,000, to now 1.6 million units. And so there is already a seasonable, a sizable impact of heat pumps in electric grids. And it seems up to now, uh, the utilities have been able to cope quite well. If we look at industrial applications, we have some additional data I can say, but this is not um, not joined, not merged with the other data, but we have about uh, 17, 18,000 industrial heat pumps, big heat pumps that come in a range of up to uh, 33 megawatts. And they are also, of course, responsible uh, for, for, for load on the grid and need to be taken into consideration. I gave you already all the advantages of the technology. Let me just point here to the lower left box of this graph, demand response potential 3.4 terawatts, uh, terawatt hours if all heat pumps were taken as active nodes in the energy system, if all buildings were seen as active nodes in the energy system, so then we would, uh, we would be able to do that. Um, we have to do some work on this because that is not the, the potential is there. The real application to stabilize the grid is often uh, not there yet because we don't have the business models. Heat pumps, and that's what we also put into this paper, are also uh, pro produced everywhere. So they are providing employment and, uh, and perspective to even remote areas of Europe. You see here the different manufacturing sites, 165 by latest count in 2021, and employment around 90,000 uh, full-time equivalent. This is necessary to, install, to plan, install, uh, and maintain the heat pump base that we are seeing, these 1.6 million. Is that enough? And here we can go back to the commission documents. We have a plan for 1.3 percentage points of heat pumps uh, increase per year. We are seeing in reality an increase of less than one percentage point. So we can clearly say there is much more effort that needs to be done. And this is actually, actually against quite an interesting, very positive forecast. So the reality is not growing, it's growing quite well. It's not growing as fast as it should. And then we are seeing that the forecast for 2030 says, okay, we should electrify most of um, residential buildings by 2030, already 40%, and 65% of all, of all commercial buildings. And if we put this into perspective of a European building stock of 115 to 120 million units, and the existing stock of heat pumps slightly below 15 million, then we have an increase that is necessary of by a large a factor of four. And then you will probably agree that this needs to be announced early, it needs to be planned properly, so that it's not disrupting the planning cycles and the build up cycles of electric grids <clears throat> that the utilities are doing anyways. The whole thing is substantiated once more also by the latest document by the European, uh, by the International Energy Agency, the IEA report. Um, net zero 2050 that says very clearly by 2050, so even one uh, 20 years further back, we should have 1.8 billion units heat pumps in, in the whole world. And that has brought, uh, brought the parties that I bring here to the table together, 13 signatories. Um, that have agreed, we have approached them and said, okay, let's, talk, let's ask the experts, what do you think, will this large scale heat pump deployment destroy uh, your planning cycles? Will it jeopardize the supply for European citizens and for European industry when it comes to uh, electricity supply? And they uni universally said, uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's not happening now, it's not happening in the future. We have experience in building up our grids. We are reacting to market signals. So it's very good from the European Commission to, to show leadership in the electrification of society because then we will react to it 
And you can see here that ILEC uh, ESP from, so ILEC from Spain, ESP from Ireland, ODF, uh, all these groups have, of course, many countries that they cover, ODP, NL, Electrica, Futura, E.ON, uh, Ibadrola, Luminus, ETSO, so the Association of the Distribution Grid Organizers, uh, Operators, Statcraft and uh, UFA from France, they all agreed we have shared this with a few more um, associations and companies and some of them are still considering, so the list of signatories may actually increase. Um, so what's the conclusion? The more heat pumps are possible, they will not jeopardize the grid. Um, they will actually help to increase the efficiency in buildings, so they will help to increase energy efficiency first and support that principle on a European level. Um, we actually conclude that electrification is needed to achieve the energy and climate objectives. And maybe more importantly, heat pumps will not so much be a problem or a challenge, but actually a contribution to a solution. They will, they will help to stabilize electric grids and they will help to increase the share of renewables in said grids. And if this is so great, then what do we want from, from the policymakers on the European level? Ambition levels should be kept high. Um, we need a promotion, an early promotion for efficient electrification of heating and cooling, and we need an implementation agenda because having all these targets, this is perfect, but they also need to, to be implemented with concrete measures on the ground, including early and dedicated communication, including regulatory and also financial support. This is, this is the, the key statement. You can find the statement on our website and in the different social media. But I leave now the floor to the, the experts to give some initial comments. We will start with Samuel Perez, then followed by Chantal Degon and by Daniel Agostini and then Pierre Loeck. And Chantal has joined us uh, in the meantime. So hello and welcome. Bienvenue, Chantal. And you have heard. So we will wait for your <laughs> comments after Samuel's. Please, Samuel. You. No, we still can't hear you. I'm still muted. Yeah. yeah, right now. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, uh, I just to show you uh, uh, our analysis show that uh, electrification in the Spanish uh, network it will be not a problem or a less, uh, is, it will be not a problem that uh, will not be able to solve. Yeah? Um, electrification is key for decarbonization. We, uh, the utilities uh, started a, a couple of decades ago by, by producing a, a generation, electrical generation using renewables. Right now, our interest is not on the production side, but on the demand side. Uh, that, is, that is the electrical vehicles, the heat pumps, and of course, the potential electrification of an industry in a, in a medium term. Um, what we do to be sure that the networks uh, will be ready for this new demand was to simulate the situation, taking into account uh, we have already a good level of digitalization in, a, in our networks. So we, we make some clusters of, uh, for electrical vehicles and heat pumps because, uh, of course, you know, it's not the same half a, a big city than a, a small village in the, in the middle of the country. So we take uh, the demand patterns for, for these equipment and make the simulations. It uh, allowed us to identify the constraints and, of course, uh, planify the, the investment needed to, to address this, this situation. Um, yeah, uh, we simulated uh, uh, taking into account the, the, uh, the Spanish uh, planification for the energy systems uh, up to 2030. And our figures is uh, we will need to introduce 4 million of heat pumps and 5 million of electrical vehicles. Um, the problems, the places where there will be some constraints represents the 2% of the secondary transformer are just 1% of the low voltage networks. So uh, the short and medium terms, there will be no problem. And in the long term, will use enhanced digitalization just to, to go with this. As, as Thomas mentioned before, 
uh, heat pumps and electrical vehicles could be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So if we just summarize, we take into account uh, the good level of digitalization of our, uh, our system, we estimated the demand and localized the weaker points on the network. Uh, and the conclusion is uh, the network will be continuously updated to meet these new demand requirements and the reinforcements, the reinforcements sorry, needed will be within the network investments plans. Don't, it will be not a problem. And on the long term, enhanced digitalization, the smart charging and the smart heat pumps will be key enables, enablers for this. Just to finish, the Fit455 package uh, offers a unique opportunity to boast electrifications, especially in the building and industrial sector. For example, here we can mention uh, the need for update the primary energy factors or just to set uh, a timeline to restrict that systems that are inefficient and pollutant to our economy. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Samuel. That that was already encouraging. I think it, it really supports what you also signed up to. Uh, can the others share the same uh, the same perspective? Would you say it's it's the same situation? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, it's the same situation in France, Chantal. Uh, hello, everybody. Here's uh, what I wanted to share with you about France. France uh, in France, heat pump is also breakfast. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I will start with. First, I, I would like to start with uh, figures about France. It's uh, page two, please. Thank you. It's about the, the stake about buildings. And uh, maybe can we have the ne next one, next slides? Thank you very much. Yes. I wanted to share with you the, uh, the situation of the uh, building sector in France. Consumption remains stable and emissions are struggling to fall. As you see, even if it has fallen down between 2007 and 2014, now it's quite stable. And as far as we have to achieve a near zero emissions sector, we have to find something which are going to break through the, the, the situation. Next one, please. Thank you. Heat pumps. Our first solution, the solution, it is efficient, and uh, as you see on the little graph, uh, it's uh, an efficient uh, equipment with a production of four kilowatt hour of heat with one kilowatt of electricity. And uh, I put some figure when it is replaced in a fossil boiler, it is as power is concerned three or four times less than the power of thermal boilers, and it consumes five to six times less final energy. And heat pump has the, the advantage of ticking several boxes, energy efficiency, uh, re reduction of CO2 emission, and also uh, it is renewable. Looking at what could have a massive rollout as an impact on consumption and load. I refer to a study that I sent you. It is the FTO, it's the Transportation French Grid and Adam study that shows that the development of electricity and electric heating with efficient solutions such as heat pumps has no significant impact by 2035. And it can generate a little there or even decreasing evolution of electricity consumption in peak. Why? Because you have the different effect of the efficiency of usage. And also we can see that there is a developing of flexibility and there is one potential with thermodynamics water heaters. And we also have new flexible uses such as electric vehicle charging. So this is very important for the balance between demand and generation. And then to end with my little speech, 
I would like to say that it's the next one, please. EDF is aiming at being the, the leader in the sale of air to water heat pumps on the French renovation market of houses. And some of our actions are investment in R&D lab, lab, labs, in material testing, co-development with uh, uh, society, big society, to expand the product range. And we also prepare the next generation of heat pumps with value added and dig digital tools and services. And uh, our experience is that the problem is to accelerate the pace of this uh, uh, evolution of uh, the market with a carbon first policy in addition to policy measure on energy efficiency. Also a revision of taxation policy of carbon-based energy. I just take an example. In Belgium, the difference between gas and electricity prices are such that when you uh, replace a, a fossil uh, boiler with a heat pump, it costs you bigger for heating your, uh, for heating your house just because of the difference, because the, 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 the efficiency of the heat pump is not enough to compensate the difference of, between the costs. Right. Third, you have to make the installation of a heat pump accessible to low income households. This is very important because in France, for example, half of the populations are modest households. And also it might, it's a little different than building, but Heat pump is also a solution to help decarbonize the industry, but it means financing funds too. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Chantal. We have, of course, a few questions. We let Daniela uh, give his perspective and then we come back to you. And we start with you because I know you're a bit uh, short in time. So Daniela, please. Yeah. Maybe from Italy, but also for your from your global perspective, is is the are the electric grids the same across the world? Maybe you can touch upon that. Yeah, no, no. Obviously, uh, the grid world is a very beautiful, fascinating, complex, and diverse world across uh, across the globe. So it is very different. I think you know your question and and the, the topic today on the panel is a tough one. I mean, it's a tough one because there's no excuse. You know, it's not a tough one because it's complicated. It's technically what's going to happen. No, it's just there's no excuse for not accelerating the rollout of heat pumps today in Europe. It's a proven technology. It works. It performs. We have uh, records of the increase in performance. And the only reason you just need to look at the level of penetration that heat pumps have in the commercial world, where they are really rolling out majorly, every commercial mall has heat pumps, every office has heat pumps, where we're struggling is in the residential. And the why? Because of course, there's non-economic barriers, there's lack of information, lack of access to capital. So the technology is proven, uh, it can deliver those short-term significant reductions that we so badly need for uh, the fight against climate change, but also increasing the energy efficiency of Europe and reducing uh, um, pollution in our cities, which is another big issue. So what are the key issues here that are stopping the rollout and getting to those millions of heat pumps that we're asking for in the letter? There's three types of, uh, of challenges, if you want. The first one is regulation. Regulation is proving very slow to adapt. Uh, one of the big additional advantages of heat pumps is the synergies that these heating and cooling devices have with the electricity world. They can provide badly needed flexibility to increase in renewable penetration. And so until we do not get uh, more advanced regulatory regimes ready to remunerate that demand side flexibility, there's still the, 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 the penetration is not gonna be there because of course, if I have a heat pump and I can actually use it to get money, from my, uh, my supplier or from my distributor for providing those flexibility service, it is key. We made a very interesting study with our Enel Foundation, uh, Enerdata and Compass Lexicon that was looking at the role of heat pumps in providing that flexibility. It's amazing. I mean, heat pumps can very flexibly respond to a rising uh, uh, supply of renewable solar or you know, cut back in the order of 25%, both in the winter 
and in the summer. So again, it's a source of flexibility that's available both in the winter and in the summer. And it has a large synergy with the fact that our buildings have a very high thermal inertia. So it's easier to turn off your cooling and turn off your heating for a couple of hours without really changing the comfort zone. Of course, this is true on a daily, maybe weekly basis. As we go more on the long term, the flexibility of heat pumps is not as effective and we need other flexibility. But for the daily flexibility, heat pumps are, are our deal. Our estimates is that you can probably uh, demand side to manage uh, these heat pumps, you know, two, three hours a day for a total of 800 hours a year. And we're talking 50 to 15 to 50 gigawatts of a connected capacity. So again, a tremendous flexibility. Now, you see, you know, where do we see this in other parts of the world? I mean, of course, we have operations in the US and the US, this stuff is, is bread and butter. Utilities are used to uh, remote controlling uh, air conditioning and uh, climatization. Why? Well, obviously, they started earlier. I mean, they were installing these devices way ahead of us because the condition in the US penetrated more quickly. So they're more advanced also in uh, both in the technology and in the regulation. And also partly the regime is a bit different. There's a, a, a greater integration along the value chain, which may have an impact. So again, regulation is, is with the first key challenge. The second key challenge is distribution grids. I mean, we have very smart grids in Europe today. They are being upgraded, but we have to be aware that if we do want to accelerate decarbonization, we need to make sure we stay on track with our investments in the grids. Uh, the IEA estimates $30 billion uh, a year of investments in distribution networks in Europe in 2019. Uh, by 2040, the same IEA estimates, we're going to have to go up to 40 to $60 billion uh, per year of investments. Now, this may, you know, it may, may seem uh, like a lot of money, but if you think that these investment in grids are actually going to be delivering on a whole range of services and goods, they're going to be habilitating our heat pumps, they're going to be habilitating our electric vehicles. So again, the key thing here is to remember that distribution networks especially uh, need to keep those investments coming in their direction to make sure that our grids are digital and are ready to manage uh, heat pumps as they penetrate the market. And that is key. The market, as Thomas, you've shown, can provide on the supply side of the technology uh, of heat pumps, uh, renewables on the supply side, heat pumps on the demand side. But when we go to infrastructure distribution, we do need better policies and making sure that it stays on track. And in that sense, maybe we're a bit struggling even in the European Green Deal. Uh, there's a lot of work on supply and demand on the networks, uh, maybe more attention needs to be given. So first one, regulation. Second one, network. Now the third one, of course, is the buildings. Uh, in Europe, there's a lot of existing buildings. As we know, the big challenge is the renovation wave. Uh, the same study that I mentioned earlier, uh, done by a foundation, Compass Lexicon, and, uh, um, and Enerdata, uh, showed that in order to reach this increased ambition by 2030 and go to zero by 2050, we do need to drastically increase the renovation rate. We need to go from the current 1% to 3.5% by 2030 and stay around four to 5% all the way to 2050. And that will ensure that those level of electrification, Thomas, that you were talking about, so 40 to 50% by 2030, and we estimate 70% electrification in the building sector by 2050 can actually be achieved. So again, uh, we're not talking about huge challenges. They're very actionable. The regulation is easy to implement. It's just a question of also best practice sharing. Investment in networks, especially on the distribution side, we need to make sure that we stay on top of this and we keep leading in the world because again, we've seen great things happening uh, in the US, but also we're working in Sao Paulo and there's a whole new uh, digital innovability in, in Sao Paulo that is taking place with innovation funds by the, the uh, local city government, and, and it has a major lead role in this, in digitalizing uh, their grids. And it's really incredible what you can do. And the third one, which is maybe the hardest one, is the buildings. However, on the buildings, we have the opportunity of the recovery plan funding, which is providing significant amount of capital. We need to make sure that the uh, industrial players in the building compartment are actually able to quickly take advantage of this opportunity 
and work on the European buildings in the next uh, 10 years in order to make sure that we have enough heat pumps uh, to actually decarbonize aggressively Europe in the next 10 years and get to 2030 with a very good rollout. I'll leave it to that for now, Thomas. And thank you again for organizing this, uh, this event. Thank you very much. I, I hear only positive voices. Um, so now we give Pierre the opportunity to be a bit more critical. We have a few questions, however, that I wanted to bring up after Pierre's intervention. Pierre, please. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Can you hear me first? Perfectly well. Well, I might disappoint you because I don't intend to be <laughs> to be very ne negative. Uh, I mean, I, I actually uh, agree to a large extent uh, with with everything that's been said so far. So you you, you will find generally that the uh, the Commission welcomes uh, this initiative, and I think is uh, is aligned with the main messages. But uh, let me try to to convey what I would think are the, the main policy messages around the topic. The first one is that. Uh, heat pumps uh, are necessary and not only necessary, but you will find that they play a major role in any serious decarbonization scenario. So we can discuss a bit the extent to which that's the case, but it will be the case for any scenario. Why? We heard it already. Uh, first, because it's a quite mature technology that is quite cost competitive today. Okay, not 2030, not 2050, but today. Uh, second, it's highly efficient compared to the technologies that the fossil uh, technologies that it may, it's meant to replace. Uh, and that's why we insisted so much, if we go back to the, uh, the energy system integration strategy that we published, um, why we have this logical sequence of energy efficiency and then direct electrification, uh, where heat pump really play a, a major role as far as, as buildings are concerned. But again, it goes more and more uh, away from just residential buildings toward commercial, some industrial uses, some uh, smart, uh, also low temperature uh, district heating. So a major role here. And then you have this third category where essentially when all of this has not really worked, then you need to find other solutions. But that's very important because uh, the first message is probably that indeed, if you're worried somehow uh, about electricity supply in a decarbonized system, uh, or worried about adequacy or security of supply, you should start in a way with heat pumps uh, or, or EVs when it comes to transport and not jump into, uh, uh, of course, hydrogen, which is discussed everywhere. And I mean, it's, I also worked on, on hydrogen, so it's, uh, <laughs> we love hydrogen for a number of other reasons, but really in terms of electricity adequacy, I would say start with, with the easier, more mature, more efficient technologies with heat pumps uh, at the core, okay? That's the first one. Second point is that um, heat pumps as such, uh, we cannot ignore that in principle, yes, they can present a challenge to the grid. I think it's highly linked to the fact that uh, heat demand is, is, is very uh, thermosensitive. Okay, so there is a risk of, uh, of increasing peak loads in particular in, uh, in winter. I saw the, the message in the chat from, from Wouter. Um, we did look at that quite carefully, also with some ad hoc uh, modeling using our, our modeling tools. Um, I think the message that came out of it is, yes, it can add to the peak load, but it's essentially also uh, fundamentally a flexible technology itself. We heard it. Uh, the first one is that you can benefit from the, the thermal inertia of the building you're in. Okay, that's a, uh, that's a major advantage. Uh, this is very dependent on the insulation of your buildings in the first place, and that's uh, and Daniel insisted a lot on this. I think it's a major point also in terms of policy. Why? Because it means that the building renovation policy has to go hand in hand with the deployment of the heat pumps and also actually potentially of the renewables. Uh, I might come to that, uh, but the two have to go together. It's the first uh, uh, policy conclusion that I think we learned and that we are trying to implement also with this package uh, approach. Okay, just on thermal inertia, moving away from the residential buildings, uh, if you think of the district heating and the huge inertia in those networks, I mean, the impact is even, even bigger. Okay, but, but that's one. Um, what we found out as well is that you can add quite easily some thermal storage. Uh, and I mean, many of the heat pumps actually come with a, with a tank already. And already, uh, if, if you put a, an additional buffer of, let's say, two hours, in most cases, that's enough to uh, to allow to shift your demand past the, the peak, uh, at least when we are talking about daily uh, uh, daily flexibility needs. Okay, so that's that's again something that is 
out there, I would say, in the market uh, to alleviate part of, uh, of, of this problem. Then, uh, again, looking at what you can do, uh, you can try to start doing very smart things with uh, solar uh, on buildings, for instance. So if you couple it with your PV on the roof, uh, together maybe with a battery, if, if, if there's a case for that, then again, it's another option to run it uh, uh, in a smoother manner for, for the system. And uh, the last one, that's a bit more discussed, but we modeled, modeled a bit uh, the impact is, is this notion of hybrid heat pumps, which are not hybrid heat pumps, but essentially having a, a sort of backup boiler, uh, which by the way, does not need to be necessarily a, a fossil based or, or gas boiler, it can be renewable as well. Uh, but I would say it's the ultimate flexibility option that you have for heat pumps to, uh, uh, to also uh, go past of uh, some of these peak load, uh, peak load issue. But uh, long story short, there are options. It's a technology that is uh, mature. I think where we will see a lot of learning and innovation is more on, on the different operation strategies of your heat pumps uh, to actually uh, adjust to this uh, challenge for, for the grid and the, and the system. We will learn a lot, uh, for, for sure. Um, but but I, I, I guess, again, uh, jumping a bit on what Daniel has said, it's not so much the technology, it's about um, really bringing that business case a bit more into the market so that indeed the heat pump is not a dumb asset, but really becomes a smart asset that offers that flexibility to the, to the system, either to the, to the grid manager or to the, the various markets, the wholesale, the ancillary services, what, what have you. Um, and here, that's where, that's where indeed regulation and policies come, come in. Um, I think we did, we did a lot of progress <clears throat> in, in the clean energy package in, uh, in trying to revamp a bit the, the rules for the electricity market, but now we need to implement uh, all of those, in, including through, through network codes. Uh, that's a, a big area of, of work. It's not all about new legislation. That's, that's a message. It's a, a lot to deliver on existing stuff. Um, but uh, it's also about working further, I think, on the price signals, uh, not only the energy component. Again, the clean energy package, when it comes to the energy component of your price signal, hopefully we will, we will see some more variability, uh, provided you have, uh, uh, let's say, time variable tariffs, you could have some of this incentive. But I think where we need to focus a lot more, and that will be in the scope of, uh, of what we will present uh, next week, um, it's the other components of the, of the retail price, uh, in particular the, the taxation, uh, with the Energy Taxation Directive and the carbon price. I mean, these are uh, elephant in the rooms when it comes to bringing uh, electrification in your system and, uh, and working on the, on the relative competitiveness of heat pumps uh, relative to other uh, other options. Um, those were the main message. I will I will stop there so that we we keep time for the the Q and A. That's perfect, Pierre. Thank you, and you answered quite a few of the questions that were uh, brought forward here in the Q and A already. And it's actually, I see that there is a lot of interest in in answering questions. So let me start with uh, the first question. Uh, that was I can summarize probably a few that are uh, with regards to storage. Uh, what's the importance of storage? How is that recognized in the uh, different um, simulations? Um, and we start with Chantal because you mentioned uh, specific, specifically the importance of uh, water-based storage also for grid balancing. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Yes, the, 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 the capacity of uh, the water heating storage is quite big. At the moment in France, it's about six, six gigawatts of capacity and with the new uh, uh, thermal uh, equipment that will be much more, I think, too. I think the, um, the flexibility is not only in a storage, it is also in the flexibility of using the heat, the heat pump while heating the different uh, rooms of the house or the, or the household, I mean, of the, of the, of the buildings. This is very important. And this is why we are working on this uh, flexibility of this uh, of this uh, this equipment. As the previous speaker says, you have the the storage that is inside the buildings with the, the energy efficiency, but you can also within one hour or for just half an hour 
uh, move place to another place inside in in the in the in the day that could help that can help the um, I mean the the, the, the balance between uh, production generation and consumption. But just let me give me let, let me give an example. Two hundred thousand heat pump were inside in, installed last year in France. No problem on transportation network, nor in distribution network, no problem at all. The only thing that we are uh, pointing out is that there is always connection problems, trouble. That is the right dimension of the heat pump or, or the connection between the house and the grid. But at the moment, there is so few heat pumps on the market that there is no problem at all. Then in France, you have, uh, uh, you are speaking or reinforcing the grids. At the moment, this is, that could be a matter in, um, I mean, less, uh, well, in cities, there is no problem. When it's much more uh, outside the city or when it's, you have less people, it can be a problem, but at the moment, no, we can see no problem at all. And uh, well, I don't know if I answer you. You're, 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 at least, uh, last point, and it is very important. With the development of smart meter, and we have Linky in France, we have the opportunity of piloting the flexibility of the heat pump or some equipment when you are providing electricity to a customer. So this is going to be used, and this is also a game changer while adapting consumption to the generation of electricity. Thank you very much. Yeah, that answered at least. Uh, what, what are the others thinking? And let me add one aspect to the discussion, because we, we heard it here too. Uh, you are all coming from developed electricity markets, I would say. I mean, France is known for its electrification. Um, the, the, there was even a label for houses in the in the past, the Promotelec, so everybody would assume that France can handle much more electricity. Now, the question here is, uh, what, what about other countries, maybe more Eastern European countries? Is, it, is this all only possible if you have already an established grid, or are there lessons to be learned from your combined experiences, Samuel, Daniel, and Chantal, that we could also give to uh, the grid operators in, in Romania, in uh, the Baltics, in Poland, etc.? Okay. Uh, well, it's it's a hard job to give lessons. Nobody can give lessons to other countries, you know. But uh, what we experiment is that first electrification is coming little by little, so you have time to adapt. Then uh, what is key is the flexibility used or transmitted transmitted uh, through the tariffs or the uh, the price signal, and this is the big value of flexibility and it helps the, 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 to, to, to balance, uh, uh, to, to, to handle with the grid. And then, well, I would say uh, uh, smartness, smartness fr from the, uh, the meter and from the equipment. And this allows a lot of things even if sometimes in some places, reinforcement of the grid, of distribution grid could be needed. Hmm. Samuel, Daniela, thank you, Dan Chanta. Um, <clears throat> well, for, from my side, no, I think uh, we're actually in Romania, we're having some very positive surprises in terms of, uh, uh, of heat pump penetration. Of course, as I, I think Pierre mentioned uh, earlier, um, there's a, a big uh, issue in terms of existing assets. Uh, in, in Eastern Europe, we have these assets of district heating uh, systems that are very valuable and uh, that are, you know, on some on one hand a value, on the other hand a challenge in terms of uh, integrating this technology into this, uh, this district heating system, but it, it is possible. We've seen it uh, in, in Denmark and in other Nordic countries. So again, it's a question of adapting uh, the, the technology to, low, to the local and of course, uh, that there's a lot of attractiveness in gas. It seems like an easy win, uh, but that is, I think, mainly because people don't really understand how different the day, the world tomorrow, not the day after tomorrow, but tomorrow, how different that world is. I saw a lot of questions in the chat that seem very much, 
anchored to the old way of doing things. What happens on peak and on cold weather, on peak demand and thermal. I mean, we're talking about a world where we're gonna have a heat pump in a, a, almost a zero energy consumption uh, building and uh, a big battery in your garden connected to your, uh, to your system that can give you backup. So you really need to think out of the box because the world is gonna be very different. It's, it's, it's like, you know, what, what am I, you know, it's like having CDs in a world where it's dominated by MP4s. And so I think that's where a lot of the struggle is. And the great thing about heat pumps is that heat pumps navigate very easily the transition. So they're ready for the world today, but they're also resilient to the change tomorrow when we will have zero emission, uh, zero energy buildings, electric cars. So in that sense, uh, I, I think uh, also in part of uh, uh, the countries that we see on the East and sometimes in the East, there's a struggle to understand how quick and radical that change is gonna be. And I can say that because again, I haven't been, I work across the board also on renewables. We had this problem with the renewables 10 years ago. Oh, what we're gonna do with photovoltaics and how the system's gonna adapt and what's gonna happen. And today we have in Europe more than half of the electricity production being provided by uh, uh, new renewables. And you know, the system is surviving quite well. So the system is adaptive, get ready to change. And uh, the, the other big thing we haven't talked about is unfortunately heat pumps are key because they're also a measure not only of mitigation, but also adaptation. Heat waves will be the norm more and more, unfortunately, frequently the norm also in Northern Europe. And so in that sense, we will just see the market pulling in this technology and we need to make sure that the regulation, the infrastructure and the buildings are ready to uh, host it in the most efficient way. Thank you, Samuel. On your side? No. You... Yeah, not, not very much to add. Just um, signaling that uh, in not uh, as, as uh, France, Spain, Italy, or the northern countries, economies, uh, let's say less developed, this will present an opportunity because they, they can uh, think in, in the planification of a network and even a new infrastructure already digitalized it. And it will allow for, for a lot of, of different things, taking into account the batteries of, of uh, our cars and uh, that in few years will be, most of the cars, the new cars will be electric. And, uh, also the heat pumps and using as a thermal uh, battery, this could represent a way of uh, demand management and uh, this will solve a lot of problems, yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I had written down a few questions, but I think it's, it's maybe interesting to, uh, to come back on those later, or you know them anyways, and address more what the, uh, the audience wants. And, I, and we see it here, there is these two questions where, Daniel, you say that you're focusing, uh, you, you take an old, fashioned or backwards looking perspective. One here saying, will we really have enough green electricity for 50 million heat pumps? I think you answered that already with a pretty resounding uh, yes. And the second one and is, is this question of what happens if we have three weeks of uh, cold spell and, and the wind, there is no wind blowing and it's dark. I think this is what, what drives, really drives people. Um, I, I, that, that, that really touches me because, uh, you know, everybody talks about this. Oh, look what happened in Texas and all the wind turbines were frozen. I mean, the, the real uh, truth is that uh, it wasn't the wind turbines a problem in Texas. It was the gas extraction <laughs> uh, systems. So uh, again, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, not particularly reliable news going around there. And you wonder, you know, who spreads it? Uh, but, uh, I mean, we have operations in the States. We've looked into it, of course, because we were all quite interested. And the real problem there was more the gas uh, system that the renewable energy system that it was so nicely shown on pictures. And so similarly, uh, let's remember during a cold spell, you can have a lot of wind production. And so in that sense, the solar and wind turn out actually to be quite complementary between the two. And so, uh, again, the study we've done with... Uh, Compass Lexicon was using a power model with hourly resolution. And so looking at exactly at what would happen in certain situations and uh, where would the electricity be coming in from. And um, I, I can tell you that uh, the, the mean is there. Hydrogen will play a role. It will have to be green hydrogen. And so again, we'll have to be good at, uh, at getting that technology in place, but using it exactly where we need it. 
bit like Pierre, you were saying earlier, hydrogen is precious, is critical, but we cannot kid ourselves and think that it's going to be available in large quantities. It has to be green, and so we need to use it in hard to abate sectors and in that seasonal uh, flexibility that will be needed when you will have that out of the uh, way. But the other question I have is, again, heat. We will have to increase our cooling habits, unfortunately. And so is it better to have a gas uh, boiler and uh, a heat pump only for cooling or a heat pump for doing both heating and cooling? Now, I think if you ask any family, once they understand that this was one of the questions, the answer will be quite obvious. And so let me, let's make sure that uh, the system is ready to host and use these uh, heat pumps efficiently. Um, I, I'll just close my statement just by saying it, it's a bit like you have a heat pump that goes on 5G, but then if you don't have a network that goes on 5G, it's really a pity because it's like when you use your phone on, on 3G just because the network doesn't hold it. So let's make sure the network is there to manage and uh, we need those investments uh, flowing. Super. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Chantal, you raised your hand. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm very surprised of all the studies that are written at the moment about uh, something like a big, uh, uh, big trouble with the grids. Uh, it is raising fear. Well, I would like everybody to turn to the, uh, the transportation grid, the responsible, the ones who are responsible with this uh, uh, grid system, electric system to, uh, to, 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 I mean, to, to manage, because I am hearing a lot of fake news about what could be, what could happen if. Uh, just, I want just, uh, I would like to say that the, coming back to the question you, you, you asked, um, that it's a matter of risk study that, um, it is uh, uh, RTE, for example, which is a transport French transportation grid in France. Uh, they are studying, they have extreme risk studies so that they could explore the consequences of uh, a long period of, uh, of very cold uh, temperature or a long period of very high temperature and so on. And it's part of their risk policy to study this. And I'm very surprised to see, I mean, on the, to see how many studies there are. Uh, we can read about uh, things coming from people who are not responsible with, with that. So try everybody, well, I, I try to be, um, to, to, to read the, the right studies. <laughs> it's very important. Well, thank you very much. And that was part of the reason why we have asked you here. So to, to say, you know, if, if uh, let, let's see what you think, because you will have to eat the soup. If the utilities support more heat pumps, then the heat pump owners will be very unhappy with you if they can't heat their house in wintertime. Okay. There is one question that I also find quite interesting. Uh, this is about the flexibility and communication, uh, smart grid readiness, smartness of, of buildings, smartness of heat pumps. What's your strategy in that direction? We see that the Euro Europe has, uh, has passed this electricity um, uh, grid d directive and there is the, re the requirement to have smartness, provision of smart tariffs to end users. Is that something that you're rolling out these days or will that take more time? Are you asking me the question? <laughs> yeah, well, since, since you have to leave now, maybe you first. Daniele is also short on time, so you second, and then, then uh, uh, some, uh, also maybe Pierre, because yeah. I would like to understand how the Commission monitors the implementation of these, of these laws. Okay. About the, the real-time tariff, we, are, we will have an offer as EDF uh, toward the customer, but we are not very keen on that tariff because it's very risky for the final cons cons consumer, cons customer. So, and we don't think it is the only way of, um, uh, of uh, piloting in the, in a, for the national sake. sake uh, we, it's difficult because the, the signal there is, considering the price of electricity, you have tax, you have the cost of the grid and you have the, the energy. And all the signal are mixing in the only tariff. So that is very difficult to optimize uh, a signal for several, uh, several objectives. 
So we are obliged, EDF is obliged to propose a real-time tariff. We will, but we won't promote it because it's very risky and it's not the right signal to handle, I mean, the, the, either the electrical system, the distribution system, the transportation system, or the energy system with the market, uh, the electricity market. Well, that's very interesting. Is that is that shared like this by Daniele? By uh, it's a it, it's a tough one because when we talk about staying behind, I think the customers are definitely the ones that are struggling the most in uh, in uh, managing you know the, such dynamic tariffs. If if we look at some of the European countries, including Italy, a lot of the customers are still very reticent to actually join the free market. Uh, the, the truth is that today the normal residential customer often is challenged by the complexity of some of these new advanced schemes that sound very interesting for a Google algorithm, uh, but uh, are very, very challenging for the customer. So uh, we need a transition and th that transition needs to be uh, well thought through. On the other hand, we fully believe in platformization of our industry. So in that sense, we believe that that is the future uh, however, we need to make sure that the transition towards that future has the customer on board and not the customer confused. Uh, so once we'll get to the point where you'll have, uh, you know, um, you know your, your supplier being able to manage your heat pump, depending on dynamic uh, tariffs, then it will be easier. Daniel Agostini will not have to worry of what is the price today at noon and should I turn off my heat pump? I mean, that's not the future we see. Uh, consumers are overwhelmed by too much information sometimes. So again, it is the future. The question is that transition is still uh, in embryonic form in terms of the psychology of the small residential customer. When you go to the bigger customers, obviously, it's, it's a completely different uh, matter. It's different, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay, Samuel? Yes. Um, yeah, also come in, I think. Yeah. Um, having uh, predictable tariffs uh, allow people to planify the consumption using batteries, using heat pumps, etc., and will lead uh, probably to lower costs. And if you are following real time, uh, at least they are less stressing. Just to, to to watch every day what the, the, the expectations in price for the next day. Yeah. And Pierre. No, indeed, it's a it, it, it's a complex issue how to how to bring it to to consumers in in, in practice. I mean, what what we've tried to do in a, let's say from the side of legislation is indeed to uh, at least ensure that consumers are entitled to dynamic uh, price contracts. Uh, we had lengthy discussions. I mean, it's, it's something that is hard to just impose on on people to take a contract like that. There are pros and cons. Um, some some consumer groups are even worried in a way that you know you could lose completely control over your bill etc so it, it, it's gradual it takes time and i think it will evolve when you start seeing you know your neighbor who's actually doing it and he's making so much uh, savings out of it each month etc and so it, it it will have to be to be to be gradual but but at least there is this entitlement uh, in the electricity uh, directive, so we will be monitoring the, this implementation with uh, with suppliers for sure. Uh, on the side of the the building, so the the readiness of the building to to be smart, we also introduced something that hopefully can help, which is this uh, smart readiness indicator for for buildings, uh, which which uh, again we will we will monitor. Um, but again, it's about uh, providing the right information for the business model to, to flourish in a way that you cannot push a business model as such through regulation. And, and in the end, it will, it will again go back to the, to the issue of the, of the relative price of carriers as well. And that's why I insisted so much on, uh, uh, on taxation in particular, on, of course, the carbon price, because once all of those things will really start to be, to be, to be felt, uh, you will have a clear incentive for going heat pump as opposed to, to, to gas and, and even dirtier fuels for, for sure. Um, and also you will start uh, feeling a bit more the, the impact of those variable electricity prices. Uh, and there you will, you will have not the customer, but those intermediates, it's an important point, not the customer, but those aggregators playing this role in between that will be able to capture this value. And, and transmit it to the consumer. And there, uh, once all of this is in place, it can be uh, it can be very quick. You know? But uh, 
but that's it. Yeah, super. Thank you also for that insight. We are running out of time. I'm still see here 10 questions unanswered. I have to apologize, but uh, some of them are so specific that I didn't want to uh, dilute the focus of this talk. So please, uh, if, if you need these answers uh, for your own clarity, then come back to us and, and write them up in, a, in an email. Um, I would like to thank everybody for their contribution. And uh, I would like to wish you all a great afternoon. Let's hope for a good and an ambitious uh, Fit for 55 package still to be announced next week on the 14th. And if you're interested in large heat pumps, then uh, join us tomorrow for the dry efficiency final conference where we will talk about large heat pumps, their implementation, some flexibility issues, and their contribution to a deindustrialized industry. Thank you very much and talk to you soon. Thank you.